Uh, it's my honor to be with you all today. Uh, I want to talk to you really on two different levels. I want to talk to you about how scientific thought has changed, how we think about infectious diseases and medicine itself have undergone a revolution in the last 30 years that no one could have imagined. Then I want to talk to you a little bit about the newly discovered organ in the human body called the microbiome. Then I want to connect them to emerging pathogens and genetics. So hang on. Uh, I always love to start any infectious disease talk with this slide. In 1969, Dr. Sherman went to Congress said it's time to close the book on infectious diseases. We have the antibiotics we need. We're going to open a war on cancer. It turns out that uh, 10 of the 16 major causes of death from cancer are actually infectious in origin, perhaps something he overlooked. Uh, what is the revolution? Well, this is a painting uh, from the 70s and early 80s, actually early 80s of a patient in Africa with HIV. And those of you that were in medicine at the time, remember the shock of a new organism. People had capaces, was it poison, was it drug use, was it an odd fungal infection? No one really knew. Uh, as a matter of fact, we didn't even know how to look for a novel organism. I wrote an article at the time uh, in USA Today, it's easy to forget there are areas of the world that make fertile grounds for the emergence of new and resistant infections. So the theme here is the emergence of new infectious diseases. And that was a radical change in thought for those of us in ID. I think Dr. Tony is the only one here alive that remembers those days when he and I were on the wards and have capacities and wonder what in the hell is going on here. Um, the now realize that we're in a Can everyone hear okay? Yeah. Um, we now realize that most new pathogens arise by jumping from one species to another. And this sort of looks at what happened? Ebola came from bats. It was recognized in 77. 0157 came from cattle. Uh, Borrelia actually is in rodents and gets the people. Creutzfeldt Jakob from cattle to people. Nipah virus from bats to people. SARS. Uh, influenza from ducks to pigs to people. And finally, Zika which is very much on everyone's mind and shows an interesting interaction uh, with the genetics of infectious disease. Now, to get a global view of what's going on with emergence, these are called flyways of migrating birds. If you were to look at influenza, influenza is essentially diarrhea of ducks. That's what it is. They migrate over western China with their massive duck farms, OK? Anyone here had Peking duck? <laughs> That's where it comes from. <laughs> These ducks, and they cohabit with the pigs synergistically. The pigs acquire influenza. It undergoes genetic reassortment and begins to infect humans. So you've jumped from ducks to pigs, to humans, and it happens every year, OK? And there's even a convention for naming so that the first city to isolate the new strain of influenza gets to name it. It encourages people to search for new strains of virus. So it might be Shanghai flu or Wuhan flu, since most of it arises in western China. Uh, I guess it was in 2013, I was in uh, 
at the International Flu Conference in Hong Kong when the Mexican flu broke out. And Dr. Sun, you would have laughed yourself to death. Everyone there has to get out a map to see where Mexico is. Because <laughs> they live in Asia. They're like, well, Mexico? Is that near Canada? I said, no, it's South of America. Oh, South America. I said, no, no, no. <laughs> so traditionally, they migrate this way. And if you were to look at the great flu of 1918, that probably killed 50 to 100 million people worldwide, it was likely spread in part by birds because they would have an outbreak in Kansas City one day and three days later in Oklahoma. And humans in that time could not get there that quickly. So there's a strong suspicion it moved with birds. When they look at birds at the Smithsonian that were dropping dead all over the place, they brought them to the Smithsonian Institute. And they have found that influenza genome in a number of birds. It's even become a wager. This used to be on the regular internet. Now it's on the dark net. But you can make a bet on what will emerge. But you can bet on other than influenza. And that's why it's now on the dark net. The government closed them down. One of the wagers was, will there, what date will there be an anthrax attack in the United States? So you could actually put a bet on that and then let anthrax loose and make some money. So the government didn't like that concept. So you now have to really go looking for these guys. This patient came in, a uh, 66-year-old male, obviously with an MRSA abscess in his neck. I IND'd it. Whoops. And of course, it's MRSA. And there's a worldwide increase in MRSA. This is not limited to Tampa or Florida. It's everywhere. The second patient here is from Tianjin, China. And this patient has SARS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. SARS was a coronavirus. It came out of civet cats in what were called uh, wet markets, where they would stack cages of animals on top of one another so that the lighter animals would be on the top cage, then larger going down. And then they would, how could I say this aesthetically, take a dump on each other. And you don't want to be the big animal in that stack, let me assure you. But the coronavirus came out of the wet markets and turned out to be highly contagious. As it turns out, that's good. It was so contagious and so lethal, it was actually self-limiting. People would get it and die so quickly, they couldn't spread it. This is a picture of the hospital in Guangdong province. Uh, when it first broke out, no one knew what it was. Um, they actually put a fence around the hospital, and they would not let healthcare workers in or out while they were sick. And they would just take a crane put in supplies of water and food the next day. This is the ICU there. The ICU is closed. They're in the front lobby of the hospital. There's a huge plaque. In it are people that work in the hospital in maintenance, medical students, nurses, physicians who died caring for people with SARS. Uh, the death rate among healthcare workers is 30%. Of those, 20% will be permanently disabled. Um, could this happen again? Sure. Let's just imagine the Tampa General having an ICU that no one can go in because you have PTSD. There could be SARS there. Uh, they're going to tear this down. So within three weeks, it had spread to Hong Kong, Mumbai, New York, Rio, Cairo, making a, the point there were truly a, a global um, economy, a global civilization. Travel is commonplace. No pathogen in the world is more than 36 hours away. 
This child was a, one of a pair of twins born in Sao Paulo, Brazil. They were fraternal twins, and the mother had Zika. Dr. Zhang, is this baby normal? Yes, it is. It's a normal baby. We'll try again. Is the twin normal? Good call. So what this gentleman did, what this doctor did, was found three sets of fraternal twins where one twin had Zika and the other twin did not have congenital Zika. It was such a brilliant idea. The Zika virus is a flavivirus. It's positive sense RNA. Now, you skipped the lecture on what positive sense RNA was, but that means it just means it can go from RNA to protein directly. It doesn't need intermediate. I remember. In 1947, it was isolated in Uganda. No one thought anything of it. In 1964, Dr. Simpson self-infected himself because he didn't think it made people sick, and he kept a diary. And he became febrile on day two. You always give yourself IV pathogens, right? Just, just see what happens. <laughs> um, day two, he had a temp, a white count of 10,500, red eyes. Day three was better. It was written up as a self-limited, harmless disease in Africa and in him. Um, in 2012, I read about the isolation of uh, Zika in New Caledonia, New Guinea. And I actually wrote a letter to emerging infectious diseases and said, look, I think this is an emerging infection. This is way outside of its normal habitat. We don't know what it's going to do, and people should be alert to it. I received a letter back that it was a self-limited disease. We knew about it. Thank you very much for your submission. I located this just the other day on my CV. When I saw in 2012, I submitted it and never took it off. In 2016, it entered Florida. And now anyone can, thinking about conception has to actually think about this. So why have these outbreaks been so severe and so unpredictable? Well, there's a couple reasons. There's social reasons. The world is more crowded these days. You know, cities the size of Seoul, Korea, 25 million people. Mexico City, who knows, 24 million, 28 million. Who even knows where the city begins and ends? Secondly, there are, there's a lot more interaction between people from different parts of the world. When we talk about globalization, uh, it involves the exchange of people, good, goods, and knowledge. It's a definition. But the people part bring diseases with them. Um, there's some heresy here. The genetic susceptibility your genes not only determine whether you can get infected, but how severe the disease will be. And this is a very important concept. And it's actually just, I'd say it's fairly new for infectious diseases. Wouldn't you agree, Richard? Because I could see a day where, with some data I show you, that for infection control, you'll do a genotype and know that one person needs careful isolation and excellent pre-op antibiotics, and someone else resistant to MRSA may not need that. So this is a whole world of looking at infectious diseases, and it's already evolving out of that area. The best example of this is chemokine receptor 5. I'm just sort of curious. Who here has heard of this? Okay, doctor, what does it do? Um, so I know it's conditional. A lot of people in Europe have it. And 
it just certain some kind of mutation that makes them just resistant to getting HIV? Exactly. The chemokine receptor five uh, is the primary binding site for HIV to infect a human being. Uh, when the great plagues broke out, there were five of them, the plague of Justinian, the great death, etc. It turns out the plague bacillus binds, of all things, to CCR5. So if you express CCR5, you got dead during one of the plagues. It was selected out. But it, we tend to think of the plagues just in Europe because people like Richard are so ethnocentric. But <laughs> I'm sorry, Richard. But they occurred all over the world. Beijing had a massive outbreak, several, of the Great Plague. Bangkok has murals depicting people dying. So it turns out, in Mumbai, India, that many places do have CCR5 deletions common in the population. There are no big cities in Africa. And for the Great Plague to attack, you need a big crowded city. So as a result, 33% of South Africa has HIV, whereas 2,200 people in Sweden have it. They're doing the same thing, I promise, but they don't have CCR5. Um, it confers HIV resistance. I wonder, can you get tested for this? Yes. Sure. You can call 23 and me on the phone and say, I want my CCR5 results. It's $99. Now, the patient that I IND'd with MRSA earlier got better. But this was a fairly sophisticated individual. And they wanted to know why this happened. This has happened because I work in a hospital. Did my cleaner contaminate my clothes? And I said, uh, I don't. What? Oh, OK. The, uh, so what we did is we talked about it. And he said, you know, I'd like to get genetically screened. He has the resources. So we got a genetic screen. But first, why would you want a genetic screen? Well, in mice, susceptibility to MRSA bacteremia is very clearly defined at a site on chromosome 18, identified in the PubMed genetic section as these sites. If these animals, OK, don't have those genes, they get MRSA readily. And those are the test animals. You don't have to worry about a 50% infection rate you get these genes knocked out, and they all get MRSA. In humans, it turns out that African Americans lack specific genes. They lack 52 SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, on chromosome 6. So for European Americans, you'll find a rate of about 32 bacteremias per 100,000. But for African Americans, it's 66.5 per 100,000 because of this genetic mutation. And a wonderful paper on that. This is a 2-3andMe report that we got back on our patient whose neck we drained with the abscess. Look what we found. Now, we wanted a test for some of those SNPs in mice, but they could not do that. They said, let us instead just give you a standard report. So what do we find? Although his blood glucose was running 102 to 105, what do you think his hemoglobin A1C was? 7.4, exactly. <laughs> OK. It turns out he was hypothyroid both risk factors for infection. Endocrinopathy is always predisposed to infection. So we got that fixed, and we had some idea what had happened. Now, what about SARS? 
why would you, working with a SARS patient, not get ill? And Asha, in the same room, with the same protective equipment, died two days later. No, it's genetic susceptibility. Okay? Because it turns out, no matter how good the isolation stuff, there's almost always a little leakage. So, what Dr. Tang did was look, and he found that IL-12 variants, interleukin-12, if you lacked some specific amino acids in that sequence, not only were you more likely to acquire SARS, it put you at risk for getting the disease, but you also had a more severe course. It's a very interesting paper. It helps explain why when, say, Kevin and I go in a room together with a patient with flu, I get influenza, Kevin doesn't. That's not luck, that's genetics. And finally, this is the Zika twins I showed you. And what a brilliant paper. I mean, you have to wonder, what was this physician thinking? He's not a great scientist, okay? He was a general internist in Sao Paulo, Brazil, that wondered what was going on. And he went out and he queried all the OBs and he had the idea he said, I want fraternal twins. Then he brought it back to the genetics lab who said, who are you? <laughs> and he said, I want whole genome sequencing. And they said, that's expensive. He said, at Zika, there was an argument. Finally, they did it. What did they find? They found out that there are specific risk factors for the acquisition of Zika virus. Congenital Zika which is really what we're interested in. If, um, say, Dr. Cardet got Zika today, you wouldn't even know it. Go home, watch TV for a day, and come back to work. But in pregnant women, okay, they have two genes. You know, the, they have an infant, okay, but they're fraternal twins. They're not the same genome. If one genome lacks the FOXG1 gene and the LHX2 gene, okay, they, and these are genes used for neural stem cell development. So if they get that in the first trimester, they don't develop a neuraxis appropriately. The neural cells themselves do not develop. On the other hand, if you have these genes, even though you're in utero, Zika has no effect. That's why it's such a difficult to define epidemic, because there's a, a de genetic risk factor to acquire it. Now, I sort of thought this was new, but I went back to the literature back when Dr. Tony and I were in school. And 1908, <laughs> Alfred Baring Girard, he was the father of rheumatology, okay? He looked at gout, he looked at rheumatoid arthritis, etc. And as he looked at this, he realized that certain people got infected more than others. Because he's following this huge group of rheumatology patients, and some would get sick more than others. And he said, that there is a biochemical individuality that predisposes to infectious diseases. This was in 1908. Everyone thought he was crazy. No, that's not possible. Then in 1932, much more data was available. We knew about blood groups. We knew about intraerythrocytic pathogens, et cetera. And Haldane comes out, and he got a Nobel Prize for this. And he pointed out that infectious diseases were the leading force in human population genetics. And he looked at the effects of malaria on sickle cell disease, spherocytosis, ovalocytosis, et cetera, and found that all of these mutations uh, affect your ability to acquire malaria. 
In other words, if you have these mutations, you live long enough to reproduce. If not, you die of malaria in childhood and your genome is not carried on. Now, in 1952, Dr. Bruton said, I know there's a gene in charge of immunology. It's got to be simple. What did he find? He found the gene for X-linked agamma globulinemia. It was a great article. You could tell he wrote it. If you read the original, it's very interesting writing for that period of time. Um, and it's obviously written by someone that's almost a layman. Recall this is before the Flexner report, or not it's after the Flexner report, but these are still not physician scientists. These are just physicians writing about stuff. Below this here is the latest part here down from PubMed on the section on online Mendelian inheritance of man that actually shows the linkages, something that Bhutan could not have imagined in his one and a half page article describing excellent gamma globulinemia. Then Allison comes along and says, wait, it's really not one gene, it's a couple genes. Bhutan com communicated with him and said, you might be right. So Allison goes off and finds at least seven candidate genes involved in susceptibility to infectious disease. Imagine this is work done in 1964 how primitive that would have been for any of us. In 1988, Sorensen in the New England Journal wrote what I think is perhaps one of the more interesting articles I've ever seen. Sorensen looked at adopted children, okay? So you adopt a child. You take the kid home. Now, is he more likely or she more likely to die of a disease you have or a disease that his birth parents had? It turns out you're more likely to die of a disease the birth parents had. What did he find? The greatest standout was premature death from infection. And subsequent studies have shown that there is a defect in the activated protein C gene, which is the predisposition to, to the true sepsis cascade. He found that premature death from, inf if either of your parents died of an infectious disease, you were five times as likely to die of an infectious disease. If both of your parents died of heart disease before 50, you're only 1.2 times as likely to die of heart disease. Very interesting study. Now, TB is a fascinating study of how genes interact. It used to be thought of as a hereditary disease. Uh, in 1814, the accepted literature said it's familial. They did one of the first twin studies. They showed if one twin had TB, the other twin had TB2. They, must, they didn't know about germs yet. The germ theory of disease hadn't come along. So they thought it was a familial predisposition. In 1882, Koch decided to rock the world by isolating mycobacterium tuberculosis and saying, this is the cause of TB. Uh, everyone was shocked. At least we knew the cause of it and what was going on. We had this sort of nailed down, I think. But then, and here we get into heresy, acquisition and activation of TB is actually hereditary. And this was figured out by a guy named Bellamy. And Bellamy was curious. He was in uh, India and Southeast Asia, and 
he made two observations. He carried a little notebook. And I remembered one of my mentors told me to carry a notebook and just write down random thoughts. Now I carry an iPhone. I write down random thoughts and lose it every other month. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so they become ultimately random. The, uh, what did he do? Well, he defined that people of Indian descent were about 14 times more likely to convert their PPD than British students studying there. So if an English medical student went in a room with an Indian medical student, oftentimes the English medical student would not convert their PPD. But the Indian person almost always did. I said, wow, this is different. But he's in India. Um, and it was in the 1990s. And where do you publish something like that? And what does it mean? So he took it a step further. He said, well, if you get TB, what happens? So he followed them for three years. Even if the medical student converted the PPD, almost none of them developed active disease. Whereas if the Indian student acquired TB, they often developed extra pulmonary TB, renal TB, TB meningitis, TB of the spine, all sorts of crazy stuff. He said, what in the world is going on here? So he sent this stuff his observations to the genetics unit at Cambridge University said, these are my observations. What do we do? So they started looking at the DNA of both groups of students. What did they find? They found two genetic defects. And it probably has to do with the origins of TB 12 to 15,000 years ago in Northern Europe. So if you were going to die of TB, your relatives died of it 15,000 years ago. So if you're of Northern European descent, TB is not that big a deal. If you're in India, you've got problems. Even to this day, it is the leading cause of death in India. What happens? The first defect is in surfactant protein D. I suspect my relatives, according to 2,3andMe, are from Northern Europe. I have surfactant D. I get exposed to TB bacillus, but the TB bacillus floats on surfactant D. And I cough it up. I don't convert my PPD. If you don't have surfactant D and you get tuberculosis exposed to MTB, it sinks right to the bottom and a type 2 pneumocyte engulfs it, and you're infected with TB. So the first genetic defect, why they converted their PPD, was a defect in surfactant. A genetic defect, not a human defect in any way. Now, why did people develop active disease at such a high rate? It turns out that people of South Asian and Far East Asian descent have less autoimmune disease than we do. They have a less active variant of tumor necrosis factor and interleukin-1. You may notice this in your practice. Do you see that? How many Asian patients do you have with severe RA? None. <laughs> so what happens is they've traded off autoimmune disease for susceptibility to MTB. They cannot kill it well intracellularly, so it spreads not just to the lungs, but to other parts of the body. And these are some other side players that increase or decrease risk. But those are the two big thoughts. Two genes control your PPD and your rate of developing active disease. If we look at the big seven, of human ID genetics, a lot of them involve malaria. 
malaria was a huge selective force on the population. Right now, just last year, according to the World Health Organization, let me ask this doctor here, doctor, how many children under the age of five died of malaria last year? 100,000, 200,000? Five and a half million. Five and a half million. All over. Okay? So, this is a huge driving force to survive to reproductive age so your genes can be carried on. Uh, the absence of prion protein protects you against Creutzfeldt Jakob disease. Uh, the deletion of CCR5 protects against HIV. We talked about surfactant protein. And the one that's always intrigued me is fructosyl transferase 2. Now, every time I go out of the country, uh, Riman, what happens every time I travel? I have food poisoning, right? That's no secret. I mean, it's no big deal. You didn't know that? Me, I think I'm just purging when I go in the bathroom. <laughs> the uh, fructosyl transferase 2 is a gene that allows IgA to be transferred from the tonsils, Waldeyer's ring, and also the ileum into the GI tract. Even before birth, your GI tract is primed against infection by the IgA molecules. If you don't have that, what happens? You get sick, and you get sick quite easily. It's a primary defense mechanism. Of all things, what intrigues me is the gene is located very close to the melanin gene. So if you have blonde hair and blue eyes, you're going to get food poisoning. Brown hair and brown eyes, often you don't. It's a very, and Lynette is all the time yelling at me, Lynette, I don't know why you're sick. That food was delicious. <laughs> so there's a genetic resistance there. My advice to you is if you want a gene transplant, I want to start with fructosyl transferase. <laughs> now, what's happening now is in flux. There's a lot of argument going on. Two, three immediate results are wrong. We're closing you down. We're taking away your CLIA license. You saw that in the headlines of the paper, didn't you? Uh, just say yes. Thank you. Richard has always been helpful. Um, you sat in the wrong place. <laughs> the, uh, is it accurate? Such a debate. It is available online, limited scope. If you really want to get the full thing, uh, what you do is you register your email address in Canada, India, or somewhere other than the US. Okay, rediff.com in India is a great email to use for this, okay? Um, you can get a lot of, uh, over 180 diseases they will give you risk factors for. The trouble is that they're probabilistic. They're not deterministic. In other words, they give you a probability, okay? Now, since on occasion I work with 2,3andMe, I was able to get, this is part of my results. The stars are the confidence level. How strong is the data for this? So I should have atrial fibrillation. My sister does. I don't. Um, I should have psoriasis. I don't. My sister does. Uh, I won't get into this. Rheumatoid arthritis. <laughs> I'm tired of Joe saying, don't you remember? <laughs> we just talked about this. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, I forgot. <laughs> Restless leg syndrome. I have none of these. So the data can't be right. Obviously, their genetics are flawed. These genes should determine my destiny, but they don't. 
So they're probabilistic, not deterministic. They're pleiotropic. Now, pleiotropic is a big word. Uh, Asha, isn't it? That's a real big word. Okay? That means the genes have more than one function. So when you look at the gene for the amino acid tyrosine, okay, what does tyrosine do? Well, it's associated with melanin production. It's associated with all of the neurotransmitters, okay? And it's also associated with growth of the respiratory center. So there are really multiple things from each gene. So when you hear this huge argument about the Chinese doctor that created children, literally created, without CCR5, that's actually not that dumb an experiment. Do you know why he picked CCR5, Crystal? Because we, do, we know that it's not associated with any other illness. It's not pleiotropic. So you could put that, eliminate that gene and know that they're going to grow up normally, okay? Because a bunch of people grow up normally without that gene, okay? So really, that wasn't that dumb an experiment. Now, should have gone through the IRB. China's a different culture. Who knows? Finally, how do we explain this discordance in probability? Why am I free of AFib? My sister suffers endlessly with it. Why am I not bothered by psoriasis? The answer is what we now call the latest organ in the human body, and it's the microbiome. Uh, the microbiome is, are the germs that inhabit our biosphere, okay? And an estimate is that there's four to 10 bacteria for every cell in your body. So I told you I was going to, to relate this to how we think. Look what we've evolved from. It was bad bugs. Then all of a sudden, it was emerging infections. Then it was genetic susceptibility. But now, the microbiome is involved. So IDs prey upon our genetic susceptibility, but also the microbiome. Just think, if you have HPV, how much more likely are you to acquire HIV? much more likely. If you have herpes, much more likely, okay? If you don't have lactobacillus, much more likely in women. The microbiome plays a critical role in how the genes are expressed. I want to say it again. The microbiome plays a critical role in how genes are expressed. In 1908, the first guy that came up with this was Mechnikov. Now, Mechnikov did a couple things. This is a truly amazing man. He told his, the other guy in the lab that cholesterol was important. So he went off and discovered the role of cholesterol. And Mechnikov himself said that we are covered with little animals that protect us. And he traveled to Italy to this famous village where everyone lives to over 100 years old. And he cultured everybody. Well, what he didn't take into account is they all eat cheese all the time. So they all have lactobacillus. So in 1908, he recommended everyone eat lactobacillus, <laughs> the first probiotics. Uh, in the 1950s, germ-free mice were invented. And we sort of came up with the idea of you can have them with just certain bacteria and what happens. In 2005, the concept of the microbiome, also called the holobiome, emerged. I like to think of it, I love the ocean, and when I swim, I realize I'm swimming in a microbiome of different organisms interacting at everything from the genetic level to the protein level. In 2008, they decided the gut was the seat of the microbiome. What happens? Helicobacter, gastric carcinoma. Inflammatory bowel disease, some mycobacteria species, other pathogens suspect. Parkinson's disease, fascinating result. 
If you remove someone's appendix early in life, the rate of Parkinson's goes down 33%. Um, finally, atheroma. When you look with 16 sRNA assays at atheromatous plaques, you find all sorts of stuff there. Some of the big ones you find are chlamydia pneumoniae, uh, peptococcus, and some others. So really, that part of the microbiome plays a role in heart disease. And what role would that play? If you look at people with gum disease, bad gingivitis, that association with cardiac disease is almost as strong as a cholesterol level of 250. Pardon me? Okay. In non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, there's totally different bacteria in the gut. This gives you an idea of the range of bacteria. Uh, the ones that I'm curious about, we're all familiar with eukaryotes, prokaryotes. Up here we have the archaea, the ancient ones. And I look at them like an astronomer. This is like the dark matter of the microbiome. They're hard to culture, they're hard to identify, they're hard to sequence. So what role they have, we want to look for. Now, how do these organisms affect the genetic output? What they do is the metabolites affect from RNA to protein, translation. Maybe some transcription, but mostly translation. To study the microbiome, what do you need? You need a metadata expert. How many possible interactions are there? I couldn't figure this out, so I went to a mathematician. And he said, oh, it's 1.8 to the 11th power possible interactions, OK? You need a metabolome expert to understand what the metabolites are that might be affecting the genes. This is all available at that site up top, awsamazon.com. They have five terabytes of information so far on the microbiome. It's a very complicated site. It's not because we don't really know what we're looking for. Searching through it's difficult. I encourage you to give it a try. This looks at 39 different sites and what bacteria are found. These are some current studies. The one that I find most intriguing is in HIV, where they're using what are called symbiotics. A symbiotic is first you give a nutrient to the bacteria already in your gut, often a fiber and some long chain fatty acids. Then a week later, you follow up with probiotics, lactobacillus, etc. But this is an active area of research. And look at C. diff and microbiota transplant. It's common practice. And emerging infectious diseases, we're not genetically equipped to deal with it. Our microbiome is not equipped to deal with it either. Think of the difference of the microbiome in Africa in uh, 2012 and the microbiome of someone in New Guinea. They're not remotely the same. I want to finish up with a quote from Osler. Medicine is a science of uncertainty and the art of probability. 